Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to the gallery. I'm Heidi Vaughn. I think almost everybody here has been here before, but if you haven't, would you raise your hand? Thank you so much for coming. I hope this is just the first time of many that you come. This is a really special gallery. I represent only local artists who are Houston-based. They are from all over the world, but they reflect the diversity of our city. If you are all the other people who have been here before, thank you so much for coming back and supporting the gallery. I feel so blessed to still be in business after the pandemic. It was a white knuckle couple of years. And um, uh, when art sales uh, were lacking, I'm very glad I'm a credentialed fine art appraiser. It's actually a very big part of my business. I value art for insurance purposes, charitable uh, contributions, estate planning, uh, and I help people liquidate fine assets every day. So uh, you never know what you might find here, but what I can promise you, it's good. We have really good art here. Uh, we have things available in the hundreds of dollars. The most expensive thing I sold was about this big for $2 million. Last year I sold the painting for $1.1 million. I'm currently uh, selling a Helen Frankenthaler painting. So we get really good things. And I would say this collection is very commensurate with that. Um, so uh, Mark Smith is a friend of mine and uh, an artist who I have a super high opinion of. I love everything you do. He's also a master printmaker and the co-founder of Flatbed Press, which is a very important printing press, not just in Texas, but in America. Uh, and he has worked with some of the most famous artists out there. And I'm really excited because we're going to be talking about the sort of things that you won't have heard anywhere else. We're blessed. We've got a couple of very important printmakers I know in the audience. And I'm so glad you're here. And um, feel free to chip in with any comments or uh, along the way, because one of the things I love so much about printmaking is it is a truly collaborative process. It is not an artist going, here's my stuff, print it at all. It's, it's really working together, and we're going to hear about that. So, uh, Mark Smith, uh, welcome to the gallery. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much, and thank you for doing this. I, the job Heidi does here is rather amazing. And, uh, place I love to come to, if I get anywhere near Houston <laughs> and other times. So, uh, and thank you for being here, all of you, on this nice, warm, early summer day. Uh, it's really fun to get a kind of printmaking club together. You know, if you've never made one and never even bought one or have one, you might know a little bit of something about it. But even if you don't, it's kind of fun to learn about because even for me, and I've been doing it for 50 years, it, it's a constant evolutionary learning process because, it's, for one thing, it's always changing. Over the last 10 years, there have been a lot of changes in printmaking. So, um, welcome. We're going to talk about printmaking to some degree. We're going to talk about flatbed press a lot, kind of give you the history of that, and let you know how this giant collection of, of uh, prints came to be mine. Uh, and then at the end, we want to do a Q&A, so I hope all of you will think of, make up some good questions to ask. Uh, and you're welcome, as she said, to interrupt me along the way, because uh, I'm very uh, collaborative about this, as well as uh, the, uh, the case in printmaking. So I guess I might start the way I usually start, and that is to just briefly uh, remind you of what a print is. And, and by the way, my PhD is in American art history, and I specialized in, in printmaking. So that's, I don't know if you can get a PhD in printmaking. I didn't know you could. <laughs> but, <laughs> but at least in American art history. So anyway, uh, I fell in love with printmaking because uh, my dad was a carpenter and I was always using tools to make something. And I found out one day you could make art and use tools as well, machines. And so printmaking got my attention immediately. And I also kind of fell in love with the paper involved in printmaking because it's all rag paper, literally made out of rags. And, a lot of it is absolutely gorgeous. So um, that's how I got started. But I think it's really important to realize uh, that the prints we're talking about are a very particular kind of print. 
And nowadays there are all kinds of prints. When you hear the word print, even if even it's a limited edition print, you may not know exactly what it is. So what's important to know, and as long as the uh, the buyer, the uh, gallerist or whoever you're getting it is honest with you, that's all that really matters. As long as the artist is honest, but um, they're not the kind of prints that we do. We call multiple originals or original prints, and what that means is. Multiple originals is an oxymoron. I mean, what does that mean? Uh, what it means is it's not a reproduction of anything. You know, you, it's easy enough to take a painting and scan it and make a print of it, a digital <coughs> print of it. So that happens a lot, especially nowadays. But these are not reproductions of anything because uh, what's done, and I'll show you this first one here, is that some kind of matrix is created. And the easiest one to think about, I was going to bring a couple of samples and didn't. Uh, it's like a woodcut or a woodblock print in the sense that you have a block of wood and you carve on it and the part that is still at the top edge you roll ink on and then you put some paper on that and you make a print. You make an impression and that's a multiple original because that block is not a work of art, it's a matrix. Sometimes they're quite beautiful but uh, that matrix is what makes the impression that comes off of that. So every single one of those impressions, whether it's 10, 20, 30, or 200, is an original. And of course, those are usually called limited edition because you don't want to just keep making them like Rembrandt did until the plate wears out. And you usually say, well, I want to make 10 or 15 or 25, or, and we, I think our average flatbed is about 25. But then you sign a number each one of those. So the artist will sign every one, always in pencil, and we'll put a number on it, one out of 10, two out of 10. So you're familiar with that kind of thing. But it's really important to learn, especially among your friends and family, that, uh, that, that there ain't no copies in here. <laughs> These are all multiple originals. Oh, well, you know what? Uh, when I went to the Museum of Modern Art to study Rauschenberg's work, I said, uh, hmm. you want me to put on gloves, don't you? He said, oh, no, just wash your hands. So that's what I did. Okay, uh, I have washed my hands. There are a few things that we want to do that with. Yeah. But but I just washed my hands, so I'm not going to wear it. It's a little easier to uh, to look at it, uh, to touch it. I mean, I'm going to start with one of the early uh, prints that we did, and this is kind of in chrono order, actually, more or less. We started flat in 1989, and uh, like so many businesses, <clears throat> it started out uh, as because of a friendship. Um, Tom English is here today, who I grew up with up in, the, in, in Wilbarger County, <clears throat> North Central Texas. And one of the guys in that town, in my, I think it was junior high that I knew him the most, was a guy named Mike Brimberry. And uh, 20 years later, I, or 30, I was living in Austin, and somebody said, hey, did you hear Mike Brimberry moved to town? And he married some printmaker woman. And by that time, I was already <laughs> in printmaking. I said, well, I gotta see Mike again and meet this wife of his. So we met and had lunch, and the rest is history. We, we decided we wanted to do something about printmaking, because I had taken a lot of printmaking and had founded some printmaking workshops and taught it in college. I didn't have an MFA in printmaking. She had an MA in printmaking, and so she knew the technology better than me. I knew the aesthetics of it and the history of it quite well. And so we decided, well, let's start a shop. And this was in the early days of Austin. 1989 is when this was. I was in Austin for about 1970 on. So I'd been involved in the art community there for over 10 years. And uh, Kathy had just moved to town. Kathy wanted a place where um, artists who were interested in printmaking, maybe had a course in college, uh, wanted to make prints but didn't have a press. So these presses like this are collaborative workshop presses where artists can come and make a print, whether they have or not ever before. They can work with master printers there <clears throat> to do that. And a lot of the artists who come and make those prints to make an edition like this have never made any kind of print before. So they need a master printer to know how long to leave the copper plate in the acid. But the artist, of course, does all the real aesthetic art work. And uh, the master printer kind of helps them get it done. And especially uh, get the additions made. Often there's two different kind of printers that work with artists. One we call a master printer, and they work right alongside that artist to say, I don't know about this color, what do you think about this? When the artist goes, no, I want it a little greener. And they work together for, for a long time, sometimes weeks, sometimes days, 
to get everything just right, make some proofs, try this, try that, until finally uh, the artist says, that's it. I want the whole edition to be just like this one. So that's the, the bon entre, the, the right to print proof. So that one becomes the one that then another printer usually comes in and starts editioning all ten of them or however many, just like that one. And that's a different kind of printer. That's a master printer in a way, but a different kind of master printer. Because they're not working with the artist so closely, they're just making that edition come out. So that's kind of the way it all happens. And uh, so we put it together. She wanted that open shop like that, and I kind of wanted to publish uh, prints because I had been studying a lot of deluxe artist books in Europe, uh, mostly School of Paris things, where a publisher would get together an artist and, and put that artist together maybe with a writer or with some literature, have some literature and text and some art, put it together, stack them up, put them in a box. So it was a deluxe artist book. So that's really what I wanted to do. And after founding Flatbed, it took us 10 years <laughs> to get to a deluxe artist book. We did other standard editions, both as what we call an open shop, where you, any one of you can go down to Flatbed Press and say, I want to make a print. And they'll just say, OK, what do you want to do? Let's look at your work. What are you thinking? And here's what that'll cost. And so that's open shop work, contract work. But then the, the really fun work is the publishing, where you say, ah, I love this artist's work, and I like this artist, so I, we're going to invite this artist to come in, we're going to do an edition. And then Flatbed Pays invest in that, uh, and usually gets to keep half of the edition, and the artist takes the other half. So that's kind of the way it gets split out. In big fancy shops, the artists will get paid $50,000 to come do that, or something, to do, come do the work. We just would, would uh, split the edition with them. So what you're seeing here are a lot of those prints that were split, either that or a uh, a publisher's proof. When we would do an edition with an artist, uh, if we say did an edition of 10, those would be numbered and signed as 10 uh, impressions. And then there would be a few of those that would be artist proofs. You'll see AP or artist proof. So the artist will get a few. These are about 5% of, of the edition numbers. The artists get to take a few home. They usually hold on to those until the numbered prints are all gone. And then they can sell the artist proofs for it the high price. Can I just interject? Yeah, yeah, please. One of the most common questions I get asked as an appraiser is, does the addition number matter? And um, when you're talking about something like those Rembrandt prints, I heard you mention earlier, <laughs> which you've just been printed to infinity, yeah. and uh, including yeah. after the artist was gone, which print run matters in instances like that. But with most of the prints that we deal with, uh, it doesn't matter. And the reason it doesn't matter is because there is a certain standard, the bonature or the artist proof or whichever you want to call it, and all the rest look like that. And in the process, especially when they involve multiple screens or multiple runs through a piece of paper, they get out of order. And so uh, whether you have number one or number three in an addition of three really doesn't have an impact on value. So oftentimes, if it's um, a low edition number, maybe someone important got it. So we care a lot about provenance. So if that first one went to uh, Robert Rauschenberg's son, for example, maybe that one's more special because it belonged to Robert Rauschenberg's son, but not necessarily because of the number. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a marketing gambit in a way. Some, some publishing houses, We'll sell number 10 first and then number nine until they get down to number one. And by that time, the price is up, so number one's the most expensive one. Some, like what we did instead, we just sell number one. If you got the early, you get number one. <laughs> Some people think the lower numbers are better or worth more, or whatever, even though you're right. We have no, no order, no idea what order they were printed in. There's a big stack of prints <clears> there. Uh, and then they we get them to sign. I can different. tell you as an appraiser, we don't give a, a higher value to something that's yeah. got a lower number in general. So that's good to know. All right, well, I'm going to hold some prints up for you and let okay, you see. You, I'm here to help okay, you, you can help. you like. I'll be my van of white. Okay. Well, <laughs> well, 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 so far, I think we're okay. Okay. I might need some help in a minute. Okay. <clears throat> this is an artist named Jack Hanley. And I don't know if anyone knows Jack Hanley or not, but he was, uh, he taught uh, painting at UT Austin for a while. But while he was in Austin, he had a gallery and showed uh, New York artists, really fine artists. He did that for several years. And while he was there, in the early days of Flatbed, probably about 1990, 1991, 
we got Jack to come in and make a print with us because he knew printmaking. Uh, he now has a gallery in New York, so if you see Jack Hanley Gallery, go see him there. He's, he's a good artist himself and, and a great guy. So Jack came in and we said, what are we going to do? Well, let's do something in Talio because Kathy Brimberry and I were mostly interested in what we call intaglio printing, which is etching, basically. What intaglio means is just a good Italian word that means the image is below the surface, which is the opposite of like, like a wood, wood block relief print where the image is on the surface. Intaglio, it's all inside, uh, usually on copper, traditionally. Uh, zinc has been used a lot. In fact, we used some zinc in part of this suite. This was a suite of three different prints on the theme of ide the ide ideologies. Uh, this is a plague doctor. This was during the AIDS plague, and so we were losing lots of good friends, and, and he, he decided to do something related to that and did this plague doctor with this little mask on. Uh, then there was one called the shaman, a green one, and then there was a beautiful kind of creamy and a white one that was the prince. So it was sort of three parts of, of uh, culture. The reason I want to show you this, partly because it's gorgeous and you, you don't see it very often, there aren't many of these left. It was a small edition. This is one of the flatbed impressions that I get. When I sold out a flatbed in 2012, the way I sold out my half of the stock was, was that I still get prints from every edition. So uh, that's why I have such a big collection. Uh, so anyway, what we did was to take the copper, and this is, by the way, a, uh, a three-plate intaglio print. That means there are three plates, all the same size, three copper plates, each one a different ink color that all had to be registered on top of each other. So uh, this, what looks like black in this background of this red, is actually red over blue because the whole thing is first painted blue, and then the red goes over that. So where that those two things came together, uh, it made a kind of a black. And then we did one black plate as well and did it really deep. The deeper the impression is in the copper, the darker that black is going to be. So we went really deep with this. Very three-dimensional and all Italian prints are a little bit three-dimensional, unlike lithography, which is more chemical and more two-dimensional. But we had a lot of fun with this. It was an alchemical laboratory. We had this <laughs> copper plate on the, on the floor, and we poured oil on it, we poured water on it, we poured acid on it. We did all kinds of stuff to get all this stuff to happen. Because we were kind of thinking about organic things like cells, cellular things and stuff. So because of the theme that we were looking at on this particular one. So we had a lot of crazy fun with that. We experimented. And flatbed printmaking in general, one of the things I love about it is uh, it is experimental. I came up with a, a mantra for flatbed that was, uh, what would happen if? So we're willing to try anything. And sometimes you would invent <clears throat> things that way. And it was great. Sometimes it wouldn't work, you'd throw that away. But when it worked, you had some new stuff to play with. So that's Jack Hanley's uh, Plague Doctor. Uh, now, and if you have any questions about any of these, throw them out, and I'll be happy to try to make up an answer. Okay. <laughs> Next one I'm going to show you is an artist you'll be very familiar with, Mr. Searles. James got to us fairly early. Uh, this is from his suite called uh, Heartland. You probably may have, some of you may have seen at the Houston Museum of Fine Arts, uh, or wherever he showed that here in Houston, was a a series of really large works on paper that he drew on graphite, of beautiful drawings. And so he had a bunch of those, like 36 or more. There's a book here in your library uh, about the Heartland suite of, of drawings. This is a little different case uh, because since he already had the big drawings, we said, well, we don't want to do a print that big, and he did not want to. So uh, we said, well, let's, why don't you pick out some of them? and we'll do a polymer photogravure. That means we'll take a good scan of it, and we'll put it on a polymer plate, it'll be an intaglio plate, it'll come from your drawing, but it'll be smaller than your big one. And then we'll do a limited edition of original prints off of that. So that's what that is. And that was actually a lot you just said. Did everyone hang with what that was? Because that's a little bit complicated of what a photogravure is. Do you want to say again what a yeah, photogravure is? Yeah, photogravure, I'll say briefly what it is. Like in this case, you normally, in the old days, would use only a copper plate to do an intaglio print, like Rembrandt. 
But then after a while, the copper plates became more expensive and harder to work with and used a particular kind of acid. And there was a guy, the one I know of up in New York, invented a way to use polymer plates instead of copper. And instead of 17 steps, what you wound up with, there was like a three-step thing and some polymer. It's not as thick as the copper, but often you can't really, I don't think you can really tell the difference visually between the two. So you can do faster additions, bigger additions, and all you need is just some UV. You don't need any acid. Just expose it to UV light and wash it out with warm water and you got an intaglio plate. So we started doing a lot of polymer and a lot of polymer photogravure. This is what we call direct gravure because there's no photograph involved. It's just straight off of the drawing itself and put into a plate, which is then put on top of the polymer and then exposed to UV. So that's kind of the basics of it. And we have we have some of those framed over here yeah, there if you want to look at them. And what, what I really noticed about them is the paper. Can you talk yes. about the paper? Oh, I need to tell you more about this paper. Two yeah. things about this paper are really yeah. important. Uh, this is twin rocker paper. Uh, most paper you buy comes from France. It's usually Arche cover or some, some paper like that. Uh, but there's a special shop in Indiana called Twin Rocker Papers, and they make their own papers by hand. They make them custom. So if you want this size of paper, this thickness, this color, this kind of edge, they'll make it for you. They're quite expensive. So uh, this was the first one we ever did that had used that paper, that particular paper. So that's the background. Uh, sort of the basic paper, again, all rag paper, meaning, meaning that it's made only with water, no acid, so it lasts forever. Yes, Does Twin Rocker have a, uh, a watermark? You know, uh, they don't always. Sometimes <laughs> they do, but this paper is, yeah, there's a watermark right there. They usually do it if it's not too thick, so that's a good question. Often they'll have a watermark that you can see if you put it over the light, and that's like their chop. And, and flatbed, flatbed does too. Yeah, flatbed has a chop that's like a, like a notary uh, chop in the corner that's, that's inkless. But ours, well, here it is right here somewhere. There, there's the chop. <laughs> 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 uh, so, so every piece <laughs> has that in the corner. So you can look at a print and say, oh, I wonder who, where this was printed. And there are books that list all those chops. And you can just sort of look at them and say, oh, that's Jim and I, GL. A fun York. fact, I'm not an authenticator. It's a conflict of interest for an appraiser to ever be an authenticator. But I do give an opinion if I think something seems like it's not right. And you know, there's such sophisticated reproduction techniques now that when we're looking at prints, and I handle a lot of very fine, very expensive prints, uh, you know, we want to know right away, like, did it have the chop? Yeah. Is it on the right side? Is it like, is everything? And this is all do it's all very thoroughly documented, so it's it's real important yeah. uh, to look for things like that. That's right. And sometimes printers who do that addition printing and print out all ten or twenty of those. They often have their own printer's chop, so there might be two chops on some. Some are the, the shop, like Jim and I GEL or Flatbed, and others is some printer. Some of those are really cute, like uh, Pat Masterson here at Burning Bones, you may know here in town, has a darling little chop for his work. The other kind of paper here that I want to tell you about that's really important is what we call chine collé. Basically just means uh, Japanese paper that's been glued down. <laughs> and so uh, what we used to call rice paper, we now call Japan paper, uh, and it's just a real thin paper that is used, in, especially in intaglio prints, uh, and it's actually glued to what, you know the background paper, in this case, twin rocker paper. And why would you bother to do that? When James actually picked this out, we were a little surprised because James is, you know, he's a mountain man, you know, big tough guy, and we thought hey, it's some kind of tough paper like a mulberry leaf or something like that. And, Instead, he picked out this very delicate, beautiful uh, paper, which is from Thailand, and it has leaves in it, so that no one sheet is the same. The leaves are all different in every sheet. So these are real leaves from some plant <coughs> in that paper. So when you put it down, you get a, a unique background. The way this works is you have a sheen collet. It's kind of good to know about that, because we use a lot of sheen collet, and you'll run into it pretty often. You have that copper plate, let's say there, and you have an image in it, and you ink it, get all that ink below the surface, and then you wipe it, wipe all the ink off the surface, so you're ready to print. And then before you print, you take a piece of this Japan paper, and you, you maybe moisten it a little bit, and you lay it, cut it the same size as the block, or maybe a little bigger, and put it down right on top of what you're about to print. 
Uh, and then you take this other paper, you put that on top of that, and you run the whole thing through the press. And what it does is, after you put a little bit of uh, 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 wheat uh, powder on the back of it, it glues that paper to this paper and prints the image right on the Japan paper. Sometimes it's done to add, just add another color without having to print it and just make it give yourself some beauty that happens pretty quickly. And you can see the, the embossment of the it's I'm just going to interject real quick. Yeah, While, whilst I have never watched you make a print, I've watched Karen Broker make a print. Uh, and you think like uh, it might be messy and it's surgical. It is so clean and so tidy and so precise. And it's really fascinating. And if you have the opportunity to watch someone actually do this, do it because you'll understand it in a different way. Yeah, that's a good point. And Karen, I'm so glad you're here. So <laughs> correct anything I say. That's not quite right. Well, Green is here too. Karen's one of, yes. Uh, Texas, uh, Texas, yes, University. yes, yes, yeah. yes. So we've got some master printers here. So oh, yeah. Uh, if I say something <laughs> wrong, grab me. I'm uh, watching them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keep your eye on them. Uh, is there a picture of making it anywhere like on YouTube so you can see a video of it? Uh, oh, you probably can. I haven't looked for that, but I'm sure if you looked up Jean Collet, you'd find a YouTube about it. I, um, I would imagine I, I you would. I would imagine. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen one, but uh, there should be. Uh, maybe I should make one. Yeah. <laughs> you should. It's, it is a fun thing to, to do. Now, Ooh. this is a different guy, you know. John That's Alexander. a good one. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Nobody loves this one. Yeah, good old really John Alexander. Many of you probably know John, and he's a great Texas guy, a swamp bug from the coast. John yeah. Alexander shows my neighbor's gallery, Robert McLean, who's part of our gallery row here. But he's uh, he's in New York now, and but he's yeah. a very very important. He's very important Texas. Yeah, one of the best shows I've ever seen at the Houston Museum of Fine Arts. These gigantic paintings the size of these walls, which were just, and that's when we wanted to bring him in, so we did. And you know, it's funny, I thought he would come in and make these really abstract things that were big and wonderful and crazy and wild. He said, you know, I want to find out I can still paint and still draw, so I think I'll just do some flowers and some fish. <laughs> he is a fisherman, so he decided to do strange fish as one of his pieces. And these are lithographs. Very different from intaglio. Flatbed, a few years, probably about 10 years, only did intaglio. And then we realized, gee, we need to start doing some lithography. <laughs> so, and we had expanded. So we got a lithographic press. From Rice? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's you. right. Karen yes, had a good press. That was huge. Yes. That was Rosie. Electric press. Yeah, it had, it had history with uh, Rose, Rosenberg. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope they still have that press. Yeah, it was well, an electric press. Okay, yeah. good. And with it came a, a, a stone lithograph. Oh, it was huge. Block. With its own rack that lifted up. It yeah. was too big. We <coughs> got it. And we found someone to buy both of those things for us. We paid them back with prints. That happens fairly often with barter stuff. But thank you, yes, because that, that became a powerful part mm -hmm. of the flatbed operation. So this, this was started <coughs> on that press. Uh, it, the rest of it was done in New York on a press that he has it there. This is a color <coughs> lithograph with several different plates. It was done on metal plates uh, and not stone, but it was also done on some Japan paper that's real thick, rugged stuff that I just love. Real tough. You can see sort of bits and pieces of uh, bark and stuff in there. Uh, but John has a lot of fun playing with senses of humor, and we'll show you another one. Sometimes politics. <laughs> But I love that particular one. He did a series of five prints. He started out uh, in Austin, and at one time at Flatbed, we had we had Terry Goodhue, we had Robert Brown, and we had a woman whose last name was Green. All of them working in printmaking at Flatbed at the same time. But uh, Terry worked on this, and then went to New York with John and finished them up there. I forget which ones were done in Austin, and which ones in Austin. This is one of the ones I love. He did this uh, right before uh, George Bush's war over there in the Mideast, and then it became even more important. And then once 9-11 happened, it became even more important. So it became one of John's really political prints to see this raven up here on this <clears throat> bleeding flag. This is also a type of Japan paper. Uh, it's not quite as rugged as the other little, little simpler kind of paper, but beautiful. Well, it's a print I particularly love. So this was part of that series of five lithographs. Lithographs are chemical, mostly. 
Uh, and they started out on stones that were made from a quarry uh, out of Europe uh, in high Alps that was real smooth limestone. And so uh, stone lithography is what lithography started with. It started in the music industry uh, because there was a composer who got tired of rewriting his compositions all the time. And he found a way just to make one and then make copies of it. So that is how lithography started. Often things in photography and printmaking start in the more commercial world and then artists kind of steal it. So artists finally realized, well, we can do something with this. So lithography then became a very strong artistic thing from, um, and you can get me right about the timing on this, but it was, I'd say, early, late, late 19th century. 1789. 1789, okay, so 18th century. So that's lithography, and uh, there are several chemicals involved. I haven't done a lot of lithography. Uh, it's, I don't know if you have or not, okay. A lot of processes chemically, usually on the stone, when you can get the stone and use that, but when you can't, you can also use uh, metal now to, to do lithography and color lithography. So uh, a lot of people who want to do a lot of color on their lithographs will use the metal plates because uh, it's kind of hard to use five or six big stone ones. <laughs> Yes. But the key image is usually done on a stone. On oh, stone? Yes, because the stone, because of porosity, it just takes the, the crayon or the liquid beautifully, and metal can't do that. That's it right. will always look flat, like it's on the surface, but stone is not. It's, it's slightly in and adds a layer, so it gives a beautiful drawing texture that you can't repeat. And no one would work with a 300 to 400 pound stone unless it gave you something. That's exactly right. Yes. And I think it was Rauschenberg who said, yeah, it's just like drawing on skin. You know, <laughs> it is wonderful. Yeah. And then when, you, when you've done that one edition, you have to grind that off, and then you'll start over again with a, with a clean stone. But it's, it's some trouble and fun to, to grind the image off as well. So, but so, And you're right, sometimes they'll do the black ink one, and then they'll do some color with paper, with, the, with metal. So uh, photography is a whole, whole different thing but allows a lot of possibilities for different kinds of artists. So, thank you, Karen. This is uh, an artist you would be familiar with. You might recognize who that is. Trenton Doll Hancock. So you've heard of him. This is an early piece. When Kathy and I were in Dallas one day, looking at galleries and looking around at artists, we looked on one wall and there was this kind of weird looking thing with uh, some carpet on it and all kinds of weird stuff. We said, who is that? I said, well, some kid named Hancock and he just graduated from college and we said well I think we want to work with this guy <laughs> so we invited Trenton down and the first thing he did were some small little etchings that were just I didn't bring those I've only got one or two but they're absolutely gorgeous he was just an instant a genius at doing etchings and uh, so we did the first prints he ever did and then uh, not too much after that they took a Kathy and and Trenton took a copper plate and cut it into this strange shape. Trenton is the type that he'll experiment and create something new almost every time. So they cut the copper plate into that shape, did a line etching and aqua tint. And aqua tint's a whole other story that we could talk a little bit about. Let's do. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, when you do a line, like Rembrandt, you, you, you scratch a line onto a copper plate that has an acid resist, like, like tar on it, a little thin, almost like paint. <coughs> And all you need is just something that will scratch a little line through that tar, and then that lets the acid in and makes your line for you. So line etching is the easiest kind of intaglio to do other than dry point engraving, where you just basically scratch the copper. <clears throat> but then when you don't want a line, you want a cloud or something that's not linear, uh, then you've got to figure out how to do that, and we do that with what we call aqua tint. It looks kind of like, kind of like a watercolor, I guess, so it's called aqua tint. But it's a kind of a difficult process, too, in that you take the copper plate. You can help me with this, too, you printmaker folks. Um, and your imagery is put on there in various ways. But what you've got to do is you've got to cover that plate, usually in a big tower, uh, with uh, rosin that's been powdered up. So it's dust. It looks like a dusty uh, uh, piano, you know. And uh, so you've got all that rosin dust on that copper, but then you have to put that over some heat and melt the rosin, which makes it stick to the copper. And so it's stuck there, and uh, where you have an image, it goes through and etches 
where that image is, and it can only go in those little dots that have been etched between those pieces of rosin. So you get this little dotted thing. You don't really see it as dots. What you see it is like, in this case, as a gray, because the dots are very small. And that's the way you get something that's not a line, but instead is an area like that. So aquatint is used as much as line etching, or maybe more. And you can, of course, it's all. I think that was a really good description. I get asked that question often. People are confused about what that means. Yeah. I, I, did, did, did everyone hang with that? Is that it's yeah. a little bit complicated. Yeah. A lot of this stuff sounds like rocket science, but when you get in the shop and do it, you realize, well, it's not that hard. You know, if you do it in person, but talking about it and putting it in words is a little bit hard. So then he came back and he wanted to put some uh, 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 acetate uh, pieces on it that he, he painted. And so that you could see through them transparently and then put that around on that. This is when he was doing a lot of those images and characters that, that their innards were on the outside. <laughs> so this was still in that sort of tradition. And I love this piece because I kind of hate it, so I kind of love, love it. it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I mean, it's not the kind of beauty I normally think of, but the more I look at it, the more I like it. So I'd, be, the, I'd be delighted to own that. Yeah. The acetone, that's glued on? Yes, okay. it is glued on. So there are various kinds of archival glue that you can use to put things like that down. And that's the kind of thing that Jim and I, GEL out of LA, would do a lot of stuff, uh, things like that. Ours is more, more traditional, but occasionally we would do something kind of wild and crazy like this. That's part of the fun. You know, try stuff like that. Yeah, so, uh, Mark, I know that you, you've already made the point that each print is, in fact, unique uh, slightly. Yeah. But, but th these acetone pieces that are placed on there were was his attempt to make them all similar? Uh, each well, time yes, he did they're that. all supposed to be exactly the same color, and exactly the same size, and exactly the same place. Mm -hmm. And that's a good uh, point because. Not the artist doesn't necessarily do every little bit of that. They'll do the first one and say, "This is what I want done," and then a printer, probably on the third level, after the master printer and the, and the edition printer, will come in and say, "Okay, put all this together and make each one look exactly like that." And they're tested and say, "Okay, you did it." And then someone can do that. Uh, an, a good artist can do that. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there's a team, you know, that's making all this happen. Often it's not just the artist or, or two people. And I just would like to point out this is. I'm just looking at this. This is from an edition of 12. Uh, so this says it's number 8 of 12, but we can assume that all of them look the same. That's, That's exactly standard. right. And then, you know, for, for flatbed, you always have a low edition number. Yeah. Um, I, I'm often asked about, you know, prints and edition sizes, and someone will call me up and say, you know, I. You know, I wonder what my print is worth, and I'll say, you know, does it have an edition number on it? And if they say it's got a number like of 500, I'm like, well, I don't need to do too much research to tell you that it's not going to be super valuable. It's just, it's just not, um, because it's, you know, rarity is one of those factors that contributes to value. Uh, yeah, when you see the big number, you're most likely looking at a reproductive print and not necessarily an original yeah. print. There are a few that go maybe two or three hundred, but not very many. In very numbers. regularly I hear from people, and I don't mean to disrespect CCA in Texas, but for a donation of a certain size, you can get a print every year, and those are yeah. in the thousands, and people collect those, and yeah. then they think they're going to be real valuable in the future, and I always feel bad when I say I'm so sorry, yeah. but they're not. They're not worth that much, yeah. yeah. So you want a small edition if you can find it. This is a more recent trend with Dolph Hancock. Trent is one of those artists who's all over the map. I mean, you never know what Trent's going to do. Well, he just did a basketball court at the oh, yeah. Contemporary Museum. I, I actually got a basketball that he designed. Oh, wow. He signed it for me, and his wife, uh, Ju Young, signed it for me, too. Oh, that's I'm cool. Delighted that's a it. piece of history. It is. It's it very cool, is. the concept over there at the museum. He's a fun guy to work with. I love yeah. hearing him talk about his work, because he is so sharp in, in expressing what his work is about, yeah. which helps a lot. So this is a yes. new series he did of uh, four different pieces. Uh, was it say exchanging variables, mm -hmm. something like that? And yeah. this is a polymer photogravure, uh, which he put together uh, to create these uh, like this black background, white images, and gray images. There, there's a gray figure in there you can probably see. It's a little square piece, but it looks like uh, this was after me, but it looks like uh, uh, twin rocker paper as well, because it gets thicker and uh, nicer than most paper. 
Um, so that's that's a beautiful, beautiful well, it's all beautiful, of course. Everything in here is beautiful. But I want you to see a, an early Trent Belt card that you probably wouldn't see anywhere. And then you can find these around. By the way, if you go to the Flatbed Press's site, which is now a flatbed center for contemporary printmaking, uh, but you can find it under Flatbed Press, you will find all of these prints, and of course, a lot more. They're the only person in the world that has a few more prints than I have <laughs> from the flatbed prints. And so uh, you'll have to come to Johnson City sometime and I'll show you a lot more prints. Uh, this is the tip of the iceberg. We're just looking at a few. Andrew, things. this one's for you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah, this is another artist that you would probably know well. Ann Stoutberg, she just had a show at Andrew Durham's gallery. Oh, cool. Yeah, Very great cool. show. Yeah. Oh. It's a wonderful image. I love her work. And this yeah. is a really early print at Flatbed. And really, not the only print we did with her, certainly the first one. And it's an old fashioned kind of aqua tint in the background, but it's a photo aqua tint. Back in the old days, we did a polymer, we didn't do polymer, we did copper photogravure plates, and they were really hard to do in bad chemistry. Later it got better than that, but this was in the early days when we worked pretty hard on that. Of course, that's clearly a, a photo-based image, and that, so that was a, a photo-based photogravure done on copper. I just love this print. Pretty typical of Ann's work. Very, yeah. I'd be delighted to own that one. Yeah, <laughs> well, this, you know, one of the problems is, as you know, that I get all this good stuff and I think, I can't sell that. I love it too much. I got to keep it. So a lot of these. This is one of them where I only have one of these, and it would be hard to sell. But I guess I can sell it. <laughs> and there are some prints. To Jake, Mark, sell. could you comment on the, the? I'm interested in the the. What's the initial transfer process from photography to get it to where you're working with it for printing? Well, nowadays because it's mostly polymer photogravure. So what you have to do is you have to get a good black and white photograph of your image. Or if it was color, you turn it into a black and white photograph. And then you got to get a film of that that's a positive film, not a negative. And you take that positive film, you put that on top of the polymer and expose the polymer, which is uh, sensitive to light, to light, nice and flat. You can do it in the sun or you can do it in an exposure unit. And then what that does is it softens up Part of the, at least part of the polymer soft and, and hardens up the other part with the UV. Mm -hmm. Then all you need is warm water and you just wash out the intaglio deeper part and you've got the image okay. and it's a photo based image. Now, Karen, you can help. Yes, yeah, the, the transparency <clears throat> has to be dot matrix. Right. It has to be a fake, uh, basically aqua tint. It has to have, uh, aqua tint is just a bunch of dots that everything eats around it. But you still have to have dots in order for the light to go around it. You just can't have a solid line. If you have a solid line and you shoot it, you have an open bite. You don't have anything. So you have to have dots. There's a huge difference between photogravure and polymer plate. We love polymer plate. Dan Weldon, God bless his plain little head, yeah. right? <laughs> he developed it. He didn't get the chemistry totally right, but he was wonderful in developing the plates. But there is nothing that compares to original photogravure. Nothing. Um, when, you, yeah. when you look at Rauschenberg's photogravures, you want to lick them. They're so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's okay. nothing like a Maple Rauschenberg. Thorpe what? Maplethorpe too. Yeah. Uh, uh, there, it, yeah. Anybody, but it is toxic. You run through assistants because they're dying on you, I think. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's awful. It is an awful process. It's 17 steps. Yeah, it's awful. You have to do it in baths and everything. And no one wants to touch it except someone like Rauschenberg or Captiva. But still, there is no comparison to the real thing. That's but, really true. But the photogravure still is better. When we did prints for Jeff Winningham and the photographer, when they looked at his photographs, people loved the photographs. Yeah. And then we did 17 photogravures for him. And he said he puts down the photogravure of that photograph. The conversation was over on yeah, the photo. Yeah. It was over because the light goes into the paper. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty. It doesn't come off. It doesn't reflect. And it's like velvet. And, yeah. and when you, you don't know why it's beautiful, right? Yeah. But yeah. It's you know that it is yeah. primo. 
You know, yeah. Louis Kahn always, the architect, said that every brick wants to be in an arch. You know, and, and I've always thought every photograph wants to be a photograph, yes. right. copper plate. <laughs> but, and it was so hard to do. There was one guy in Austin, uh, Brockley, Byron Brockley, who learned to do it, and he could do it for us. But, but when we got to like Rauschenberg, we'd say, okay. So we went to New York and got somebody that was an expert at polymer photogravure. And that's what you need, because it, it's almost impossible. And very few people do it these days. And that's why polymers become so popular because it's relatively easy to do. So thank you. I'm sorry. This is a fun one. You may recognize who this is because this guy has a great sense of humor. This is called Oral Artists Try to Be God and Will Burn in Hell. So <laughs> that's his sense of humor. This is this is Terry Allen. Uh, Terry has a fabulous sense of humor. And this is an easy one to print because it's on copper. It's only one color. It's a red color printed on the, on the paper one time. And uh, uh, so real simple to addition. But uh, I love this just because it makes me laugh every time I see it. And a lot of truth in that, actually. We've done a lot of prints with Terry Allen. I've sold his work, and I've seen him in concert. Oh, um, yeah, he's, he's a very creative guy. Yeah. 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 yeah, he's a, he's a Renaissance yeah. man. His son, Bale, is another great artist, and he has a gallery in Fort Worth now. We, we have one of his works available currently. Oh, ah, well, there's a little one we did with Bale. Um, he, he do a lot of little uh, graphite drawings of little bitty things and details like this, and so he wanted to do a, some kind of print that was related to that, so he did a polymer photogravure from it and tried to use ink. There was a kind of graphite ink that made it look a lot like a graphite pencil drawing. So it's just a tiny little thing, but I love this little piece. Uh, Bell's Gallery in Fort Worth is a great one to go see. I haven't been there, I've just seen pictures of it. And he's fine, that whole family's fine. By the way, I was going to tell you one thing, so I brought one to show you. Uh, when you do an edition of original prints, especially at a publishing house like ours or any, uh, there's a documentation sheet that goes with every one. So it's kind of the, uh, the pedigree. It's got all the information about the printers, the inks, the size, everything is all there. So that kind of goes with the print wherever it goes. I'm it's, just going to interject something, yeah. which is, uh, this isn't from an appraiser standpoint, so I frequently am asked about certificates of authenticity. For an appraiser, a certificate of authenticity is actually a total red flag for dubious art, really great art usually does not come with a certificate of authenticity. It usually comes. I would love to see that. Um, I would love to see the original gallery receipt, the receipt from Sotheby's. Um, that's what we want to see. Anyone can print up a certificate of authenticity. You could make one right now. I tell people the more it looks like a high school diploma, the fishier it probably is. <laughs> uh, that's not, fine art doesn't really usually come with that. Sometimes uh, our clients will ask for one. I know Patrick McGrath, when you use who we represent, is has been asked for them, and he makes his own. It's a letter to the buyer, and something like that, you know, is 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 appropriate. But um, but that kind of documentation, we love to see, and we love when we're photographing art. We make a lot of inventories for our clients, and we. I saw Terry Allen's signature. It's like if he was one of the artists I represent, I'd be like Terry, because nobody can read that. Um, and, but uh, we love what's on the back, you know, when it's framed, it's often like if it comes from us, it has a sticker with our name and address and phone number and, and email and the details with the artist, the dimensions, the materials, the year, the title, all that stuff. We love to see that and love that document. Okay. Uh, and this. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, this is, this is a real treasure. Uh, when Louis Semenis was working with us, and bless his heart, it was the last print he was able to do, a print project, before the, the accident happened. You don't know the story. He's a sculptor who basically died under a sculptor, sculpture uh, bled the, out. The big uh, blue Mustang in front of the Denver airport fell on him. Yeah. Oh. Fabulous sculptor, fabulous man. He taught down here at U University of Houston, right? And uh, so anyway, that big stone that came from, from Karen at Rice, uh, he wanted to do something on that, so we got that stone ready to go. We, you can see pictures of that. Even that book. It was in, I think, it was in the one I circulated. That's right. The, if you got that. our invitation, there was a picture of Louis Jimenez drawing on that stone. Yeah. So when artists, when something happens in the world, uh, often historically or politically, we'll run to the studio and do something. 
Uh, and so uh, when Abu Ghraib was happening and all that torture was happening during that war, Louis said, I gotta do something about this. So he did this torture image uh, taken from photographs of the torture uh, that was happening in Abu Ghraib. So this is the Abu Ghraib piece, but he did first, before he went to the big stone, he did a little uh, lithographic stone and did a study to kind of see how it was going to work. He was one of those people that couldn't draw badly. I mean, every mark you make was beautiful. So he did this little study, and it's a, a relatively large edition for us. In fact, this was a posthumous because he died before we could finish the edition. So his wife and, and the estate took it over and we finished the edition, but it was what he had uh, finished and approved. But, well, and this one we could probably even pass around, but. I would maybe keep it out where you can see it. But then the yeah, big I, one, I, I see it's bring. got a mark. Yeah, that's Wait. right. That's right. That's what, I know. We want to be careful. I saw that. I probably get my, my oil on these things. Um, the big one is about, the stone's about the size of half of this big thing right here. This whole half is what, three by four or something mm -hmm. like that. Gigantic. So he did the big one on that. It was a nice addition of that that I, I couldn't bring one of those. Several things I wanted to bring you wouldn't fit into my folder. So if you ever do a Zoom call with me, I have a great big uh, Jimenez uh, uh, behind behind me on my calls, uh -huh. and it's uh, the study for the fountain in El Paso with the alligators. Oh, that's it's got five idea. yellow lavender. alligators with lavender oh. and. Um, and, and people are like, wow, that's so cool. And I was like, do you think I wouldn't have good art? I'm an art dealer. <laughs> but I'm very careful to not have one of my artists because it wouldn't be fair to the others. That's right. So he is actually the only, I have a Texas art collection, and he is actually the only artist in my collection that I never knew personally. Oh, yeah. Well, he was a dear heart. Yeah. A big loss for him. Yeah. Fun to work with. Uh, what else am I going to say here? Oh, well, this is. Uh, this is uh, Teresa Gomez Martorell. She's from, uh, from Spain, and she came to be an intern. And that was, I was going to say that about Patrick Masterson here at Burning Bones. One of the great things about shops like Flatbed is that a lot of interns come through there, and then a lot of printers come through there and work there. And, and Pat was one of our best printmakers ever that worked at Flatbed. He worked there quite a while with a great, great RISD degree in printmaking and so forth. We have and, another one of hers here, too. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, I bet you brought that out. That's mm -hmm. right. Teresa Gomez Martorell, she reminds me of Kiki Smith. She just does these incredible drawings that are so gorgeous and simple. She came to Texas and thought, what's the deal with all these deer out here, all this ball moss and stuff? So she started drawing all that kind of stuff. And this is Sheen Collet, too. I see if I can pull it over where you can see. Uh, it's got this beautiful Japan paper that's over the, uh, the French paper. Uh, but she, I just love all of her work. And I wanted you to see that because of Sheen Collet. Just, and, and another reason we use Sheen Collet, too, is that it's so delicate, it gets all the details of the intaglio plate a lot better than any other paper. So it's not just to look at, it's also you get a great deal of fine detail because of the Sheen Collet. Is, it the, is the China paper, is that a rice paper? Well, it's really, it has nothing to do with rice, but we used to call it that. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's usually some little uh, mulberry tree, and they get little tiny leaves off it when it's tiny and mix it all up. That's one way they do Japan paper. There are different things they use, but it's all made out of organic materials and plants of some kind. Oh, I thought Sheen was uh, China. Uh, well, Sheen just means back, they called it that back then because they thought it was paper from China. It may okay. have been at the time. Okay. And some of the paper is from China, but, but then it became mostly from Japan. It seems to be the case. So we just started calling it Japan paper. But people call it different things. But yeah, that's why it's called Sheen Kalei. It was Asian. Yeah. <laughs> then I was going to show you one print that you can't really see hardly anywhere because I'm not sure how many of them still exist. It's also a piece of history. It kind of tells you a little bit about some of these processes we've been talking about. But Julie Speed had lived and worked in Austin for a long time before she became famous. She was famous in South Texas, and then she became world famous when she kind of went out to the big world. And so she's we got a studio in Marfa. Yeah, she's out in Marfa now. Has been now a long time. And dear, dear, dear person, fun person to work with. And we brought Julie and we said, okay, let's do an etching. And she said, oh, okay, I've never done an etching before. But let's give it a shot. So we gave her a copper plate. We put the uh, acid resist on top and said, here's a sharp thing. You can scratch all these lines out. You'll get the lines you want. She said, okay. So she did it. And we got this beautiful print 
but after it was all over, she said, I don't know that this is my process or not. I'm not that crazy about it. So after that, that was when polymer photogravure was just getting started and direct gravure. So we said, well, there are ways for you to get this to get your imagery in an Italio plate without you having to scratch every little line by hand. I love that. But I, this is this is a rare print, right? Yeah. It is a beauty. And I will like say, when, saying, I, when I'm appraising art of living artists, in addition to using the tools I use to research market that, I regularly reach out to the artists. I know a lot of art. I know a lot of real famous artists. And I'm happy to say that when I call Julie, I'll call people, they don't know who I am, you know? Yeah. And she is so nice. She's I really fun. like her. She's a dear, dear yeah. person. Well, uh, yeah, a great sense of evil. This is a, a bigger Julie. This is called uh, Rope. Uh, what's it called? Rope? Uh, rope Burn. Rope Burn, yeah. Mm -hmm. I just like the color of this one in particular. Mm -hmm. But this is polymer photogravure. So what she could do is do her drawing and painting on paper, and then we could do an image of that and put it on a polymer plate and print it in Talio. So we get the same thing that we get there, but she doesn't have to draw every single little line. The great thing about that is it allows her to put collage things in there, too. I didn't bring some of the collage things, but she can stick a collage in that from a book, from an antique book, and then it'll print it in that as well. So you'll see a lot of that in, in, in Julie's work. But, uh, and then she got her own press out of flatbed and, and uh, um, her husband, uh, Chris, uh, 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 is Chris right? I guess his name wrong. Uh, is, it kind of does a lot of the printing for her. He came to Flatbed to kind of learn how to do the editioning part. Uh, and so he's she a works. Musician, I think he's yeah. in the Fabulous Thunderbirds. He was he was the drummer of the Fabulous Thunderbirds. That's okay. right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. That's a good memory. Right. But I love all of her work. Some Me of it's, too. Me too. It's all a little. It's all surreal. Very. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, the little book that uh, Jay Scraff did of hers that had the print in it. Did you pull that print? Was that? Uh, that you know, I'm it? not sure. We might yeah. have. Okay. Jay well, I have that book. I just didn't know. Who you know, I need to see that. I'm not even sure that I have seen that. But Jace Graff is a box maker and bookmaker in Austin, Cloverleaf Studios, yeah. and, and a genius. He does works for the Metropolitan in New York. He's right there in the middle of Austin. In fact, he did the box. Yeah, the we've got a box set in the back after the talk's over that you all can look at. And we'll touch it for you. That looks like it might be a lithograph, but it's not. And this is an artist you probably should know, too. A lot of you would know. Anybody recognize him? I, I bet Andrew does. Frank Holbert. <laughs> yeah. Well, we just showed him uh, as well at his gallery. Good old Frank, yeah. yeah. So he did a series of uh, Texas birds that I'm sure you know about. This is one of them I brought for you to see. It's in Talio, too. So it's a, what we call soft ground etching. It's a whole different story <laughs> where you can actually have a more graphic looking line instead of a real crisp, almost engraving like line. You get a kind of, kind of more pencil like line, but it's still in Talio. It was a, a, kind of a tricky way to do that. And then uh, Aquatint are the colors. So that's a pretty serious Intaglio color, that's Intaglio beautiful. print. Yeah, this beautiful. whole series is amazing. Yeah. Uh, Frank, uh, another great Texas artist. You know, I, I, get, I kind of limited to artists related to Houston or uh, mostly down here, but there's, if you give me two or three days, I, I could talk about prints forever. <laughs> Well, if you recognize the penny, you'll know right away who it is. Y'all know the story about the penny from Michael and Charles' work? At least this is the story he told me. Okay. He may change it over time like many artists do. <coughs> I invited him today. He's in Europe. He says hi. Uh, oh. <laughs> he only sells in Europe these days. Like Michael Ray, another great guy. And we got him early enough. And this was when uh, O.J. Simpson was still on trial. So we didn't know whether he was going to be guilty or innocent. So he decided to do one of each. One of them's guilty, one of them's not guilty. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll see a difference between the two. The guilty one, his skin is darkened a little bit, you know, like they did on the Time Magazine cover. And on the other one, the, uh, the not guilty one, he's a little brighter. And then there's also three-dimensional of, uh, of his skull on the back, as well as the knife, the famous knife. And the, and the glove. Yeah. <laughs> and the glove. That's yeah. right, the glove is there too, yeah. You can see it more on the back. The glove don't fit. The glove don't fit, exactly. And then the penny. What he told me was, he said, you know, when I was a kid, I said, I want to be an artist, you know, have an art career. And his dad said, man, you'll never make a penny doing that. Well, so he puts a penny on everyone. He says, Dad, I made a little bit on this. <laughs> yeah.
He had a really good so he had a really good show at the Blaffer maybe last year. Um, but his work is is great. He oh, handled a lot of it. Uh, he's, I love his work. These are uh, color uh, lithographic uh, uh, prints, actually. We have a little baby one of his that I just brought into inventory. We haven't priced it yet, but you can see it. It's on my desk over there. Oh, Sharon. <coughs> you recognize this of one? Of course, yeah. Sharon Capriva. I love this particular one, yeah. For those who don't know Sharon, uh, she is, I believe, the only Houston woman to have a solo show at the Menil. Mm -hmm. um, she's wow. a dear friend of mine, and uh, I love everything she does. Very important artist to Texas and, and America. And this is a, a stone lithograph. You can see sometimes, you can kind of see the edges of the corners of a stone and something like this, but um, it's, a, it's a real treasure. All of her work is, but something I, I really love. This a little bit more, mostly black and white, but a little bit of color mixed in there as well. I don't know if she does any hand coloring. She might. A lot of artists will do a print in black and white and then do hand coloring, and it's a lot I easier. I have seen her colored prints. I don't know. If that's it. It's an unusual paper. It's a kind of light gray paper. You get paper in any color. Most of the time it's white, but this one works perfectly on this light gray. Do you know who printed that? You know, uh, Flatbed did. I, I know Flatbed, but you know who the printer was at Flatbed? Oh, the printer. You know, that's a good question. I don't think there's a printer's chop. Because it's really hard to print a stone edge to edge. Yeah, it might have been Patrick Masterson who was still there, but I think it was after that. And after that, I lost track of some of their printers, so I can't really tell you. And then I brought this one just in case we had time. I thought I'd show you another Houston-based artist that you might have known over the years because he made some really gigantic prints in Flatbed in the early days. Do you recognize this guy? Dan Allison. Dan Allison, yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, one reason I wanted you to see him was that he invented a kind of printing that, or at least I think he did, uh, that's a lot like what they call mixographia. And uh, it's so cool because you make a kind of collage you can do it on, on any, almost anything, uh, some kind of board. You like make it lightly three-dimensional. It's like a collagraph? Well, yeah, that's right. You can call it that. That's one of the words that, that's used for a collagraph. And the way he did it was he, would, he had one plate. And some of them were, he did this with gigantic. And on that one plate, he would use four different colors, the basic primary colors. And he would print one on that color, usually the lighter ones like yellow. But then he wouldn't clean off the plate. He would then put a second color on, like blue, and then print it again. He would keep printing each time without cleaning the plate. So when you do that, it all mixes together, and you get this incredible mix of, of, of four-color stuff just by using those in one plate. So he did a lot of stuff like that. I don't know about this one? Too. Uh, so yeah. Oh, God, I love that one. If you fold the portfolio, we can yeah. see this on the table. Well, I'll tell you what, let's just put it right on this. And you see all this. Okay. It's all right, it won't hurt anything. I'll help you here, this thing's heavy. It is. Yeah. This is a very special print. Oop, uh, you got it. Uh, what, yeah. what can you say about this one? Well, this, this artist is really so important. She came from Venezuela to New York in the 60s and kind of was one of the early real conceptual artists in, in America. And uh, did a lot Early of different on a porter. Things. Liliana Porter, yeah. And uh, she came to Flatbed to use mostly a series of photographs she had done of various things. And we did polymer photo photogravure of these photographs of hers, mostly of ceramic things. And this one is called Conversation or something like that. And it's about. Situation with a dog. Situation with a dog. <laughs> Talking to each other there with a little plastic guy glued in over here. We, we would occasionally do something a little bit three dimensional like that, but not that often. But uh, this one is one of my very favorite prints of all time, mm -hmm. flatbed. The porcelain is so obvious. Uh, everything else is not as um, shiny as this is. Yeah, uh, you know, Paul, it depends on the ink you use, of course, a lot, because there's a thousand different inks you can use. So in that proofing process, you wind up with the one that, you, that the artist likes the best, and it'll vary quite a bit. Uh, so this one does have, it also looks shinier just because of the, the photograph has that reflection in it. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've got, a, we did a lot of prints with her. Uh, 
And then let's talk about that. Yeah, I want to tell you about the Rauschenberg and also about uh, these these Searles here. Uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to identify the owner or the collector of this, but these are available as I understand it. Two of my favorite. Now, I love all these. There are four different prints. I actually brought the book of these. Yeah. Can you hold them up? Yeah, let me hold these up where you can see them a little bit better. And these are like the one that I showed you with the uh, uh, Chine Collet. And I just want to say, this had been on the back of that too, but as an appraiser, when I am taking something off the wall, I love to see something that looks like this. This tells me everything that I want to know. No, and that one also had a label from its exhibition history which is a key reason we like to look at work off the wall also. Yeah, these are beautifully framed. Uh, that's framed at Sarah Another important thing about prints that they have to be framed. It's a lot of trouble. But when you frame them right like this, uh, are we going to identify the owner of this or we're just going to say these are available? No. Okay. <laughs> these are available though, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, so is that other one. Yeah, yeah, that one right down there. And so is that little owl I showed you. Yeah, the little owl. Is it little owl? Uh, no, it's yeah. It's oh, it's right behind there. there yeah, yeah. I'll, I think I'll bring it out here where you can. Let's see if yeah, let's correct. Do that. I'll put this here. Yeah, we do face to face and back to back, and right. all these things usually to kind of protect them. Yeah. Then I'm going to show you one of my favorite flatbed prints. When I was doing my dissertation on Robert Rauschenberg's prints, um, I met a friend of his from his hometown. Port Aransas, Arthur Franks lived in Austin. I thought, I gotta go meet Arthur Franks and talk to him about his old buddy, Rauschenberg. So by the time I'd, I'd met Rauschenberg a time or two, Deborah Hay <coughs> introduced me to him. And um, so um, Arthur said, well, yeah, I kept a lot of his stuff over the years in his box in the closet, and you look at it. So I started looking through his box in the closet. <laughs> And he had like every little exhibition announcement that had ever been printed for Flatbed for Rauschenberg from the from day one. I said, man, you got quite an important collection here. And then I found uh, a little folder that had a little art on it that was a Christmas gift. It was still in some other paper. You take that paper off, you got a little folder with a little art drawn on it. You open it up, and there were 10 uh, polymer, not polymer, 10 blueprints that they had made little tiny blueprints this size in sets of 10 and given them for Christmas presents one year. And uh, it turned out to be the only existing set of 10 of those that exist. And now they're in the Manel. So if you ever want to sell 10 of them, go to the Manel. They, they wound up buying it. So we had those that, that uh, Arthur had. I said, Arthur, can we, can we do something with these besides just uh, sell them to the Manel? So I called Bob, Arthur said, sure. I called Bob and said, uh, we've got these. I don't know how you made them because at first they were really big and full scale body size. He said, you know, I don't remember either, but somehow we made small versions of that back in the 50s. And they all became famous uh, in Life Magazine. I think he partly became famous about that time when he did those big blueprints. Well, Sue Weil, who he actually was married to briefly, and they have a son, Christopher, Christopher who's a great photographer. I, I didn't want to say, I've sold art to Christopher. Yeah. Uh, he's been here a few times, awesome. sold him Hillebrand Maximins, but even though we're not, can we talk about not this one for a minute, but just the process for the big ones? Because I think for people who don't know, and why are they blue and all that? Can yeah, we talk blueprints about are a lot of fun. They were used really to make blueprints okay. of houses. You know, and early kind of copy making or reproduction. <clears throat> yeah, uh, it, it was a, a UV centered thing where you had some imagery you could put out on top of this uh, piece of paper and put the right chemical in some UV and you had a bl beautiful blue background and white lines. They don't use that anymore. But they did full body ones. In fact, uh, Sue Wilde was the one that introduced him to the blueprints because their family had done it. You can take a big sheet of blueprint paper. It's, a, it's called a cyanotype. Cyanotype, exactly. So if you ever see that, that's what they're talking about is a blueprint. And it's blue because of the, the material. That's right, because of the chemicals used. But just a couple of chemicals you can get in a hardware store. So it's real easy to do. And they would lie down on it on their on their deck up in New York and do body blueprints. And so that's how they started doing that. Then they did this little set of 10. And he said, well, why don't you have Sue pick out 
the one to do. And uh, so she did. She picked out these beautiful hand images that looked like a composer, conductor, conducting music or something. And so uh, we started sending him proofs. And uh, we sent him a lot of proofs with a lot of different colors. And he said, you know, I think I just want to make it look as much like a real blueprint as I possibly can. So we sent him the one that had the most uh, of that kind of blue in it. And uh, it's got that they're both signed it down there. <clears throat> but um, it was our one Rauschenberg print uh, that we did with him. And it was wonderful to work with him. Uh, super sweet heart of a guy. He was, by the way, he was never Robert Rauschenberg. I love this story about him. He was Milton Rauschenberg, which he hated. When he came back from the Navy, some of you may know this story. He thought, man, I hate this name, Milton. He says, who do I know? What guys do I know? And so he knew more Bobs than anybody. He said, I'm going to be Bob Rauschenberg now. <laughs> so he was always Bob. But when he had his first show at the, uh, the big show at the uh, Jewish Museum in New York, I, they just sort of assumed he was Robert Rauschenberg. And so then he became Robert Rush. <laughs> He's just Bob. <laughs> you know, and I want to say one more fun story, uh, and that is when Christopher Rauschenberg was here, uh, he wanted to use our internet, and um, he said, what's your Wi-Fi password? And I said, Rauschenberg. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that happened to work out just right. He thought that was pretty cool. He said, it's so hard to spell. And yeah, it kind of is. <laughs> I also assume, too, because of his name, he's probably some Jewish guy, but he was German and American Indian. Yeah, but even with that name, I don't know exactly how that happened. But, so yeah, that's a fun story. But this is a beautiful little uh, 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 Teresa Gomez Martorell. I think she may still be teaching at SMU, uh, uh, teaching printmaking. She did her MFA there, actually. But a uh, great artist. But this is beautiful. And talk about Japan paper. I mean, this is super thin Japan paper. It's just um, thinner. It's than really cute. We've been skin. calling it Owly. It's oh, just so cute. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> little Owly. All the little animals have characters. They're just wonderful. So I'll just leave that out right there so everybody can see it well. Mark, does that wrap it up? Well, we kind of made it through there pretty well, I think. So.